Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today at the podcast on conservation questions. Our topic today deals with an alpine hut and staying there and working um, on an alpine meadow farm that's in Europe. Um, we actually have a guest who will share his views about it and his experiences, and that's Moritz Steiner. Welcome, Moritz. Um, Moritz is a student who has worked with me on several other projects. And um, today, um, Moritz will share his um, Alpine Hut experience from the summers 2014 to 2016. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for your invitation, Falk. I really appreciate your interest in my work and you inviting me on your podcast. So, first question. Why were you there and what did you do there? So it was my summer job for about three years where I predominantly looked after other farmers' cows and activities that I carried out included milking these adult cows, create daily fences for the free-ranging livestock animals we had, uh, treat them if they were sick and distribute them among different pastures and quite a lot of other also similar tasks okay thanks um can you also describe um your living situation in these mountain huts a little bit more for the audience so the first two summers it was with a few other herds man together in relatively developed huts with vehicle access and water commodities but then the third summer was completely off the grid and over nine thousand feet in elevation or 2700 meters it was with very few modern commodities. So there was no simple food supply, no running water, no electricity and no cell service. So the bare minimum, basically. Next question, how did you experience that life in those mountain huts in the Swiss Alps? It was simplistic, but very fulfilling. It taught me how to be full independent in my mid teens and that in a way, materialism is not the solution to internal happiness and contentment, which is helping me to be content and satisfied even nowadays still. And it's really a lesson that I picked up back in the days and I'm carrying it with me until this day. Uh, okay. Um, what were actually your daily chores that you um, did during the day? So this is a good question, Falk, I believe, and quite interesting for our viewers. Um, during the first two years, I would wake up at 3.45 a.m., so quite early, uh, gather cows from the night pastures, milk them, uh, have breakfast afterwards, and carry out daily tasks, which included uh, setting up new fences, deconstructing old fences, cutting wood, treat sick animals if necessary, and help with the cheese making and maturing process. Uh, after which would have usually lunch and take a nap and then I would continue with similar task, tasks as during the morning after which we would then again gather the cows from the pastures for the afternoon milking turn uh, milk them for the second time of the day and after which we were brought again onto the night pastures and to close off the day I usually cooked for my crew and to other herdsmen on those uh, mountain huts during the third year, however, everything was a bit different because I was no longer looking after mature cows, which had to be milked twice a day, but I was looking after young cattle, which does not have to be milked yet because it was before their first lactation and thus they don't give milk yet. So my daily tasks have been reduced to looking after these young cattle, treating them if they were sick, constructing and deconstructing fences. And since these animals don't have to be milked, they can use pastures higher up in elevation and further away from any road access. And this leads to much larger areas that have to be covered on foot when setting up new fences and relocating the cattle. Uh, and other activities that I also carried out in this particular third year was the two hour one way hike once a week to the nearest cabin, which had road access where I usually um, picked up my food for one week and I also had the opportunity to call my family and friends because that was the only and first point where there was cell service. Okay, we can then move on. Um, 
how did this experience influence and change you as a person and you in your life decisions? During that time of my life, I projected to follow a farming career and I saw these experiences as a gateway and a possibility to collect experience for my future farming life. Yet, during these experiences, I realized that livestock farming was not my preferred future career path anymore and it stimulated me to look into other possible career paths. Apart from that, as I mentioned earlier, it taught me to be independent in my teens and that happiness is not really linked to materialism. Another important life lesson I learned during that time is to be resistant and fight through tough times and giving up wasn't an option, especially when uh, living completely alone in mountains with no cell service and no contact to others and dealt with all this together in my mid-teens. And this mental strength helps me to this day to deal with mentally and even physically difficult situations. And lastly, since there were no modern distractions, I got to know myself very well and spent abundant time with myself and my own thoughts. And this allowed me to come to peace with my inner self and really get to know me. And I think that's something very positive, especially for young adults. Well, I'm pretty sure you learned a lot there, but um, I'm wondering what is your what was your biggest aha moment? Moment. Yeah, you are correct. I, I did learn a lot, I think, uh, but certainly the realization of my love and passion for outdoor work and work in mountain environments is a a big a aha moment, and the realization of what a human mental and physical strength can endure was additionally certain certainly something I learned back then. From a wilderness perspective, perspective, what was your most memorable interaction on that topic regarding nature and environment? Throughout my three summers in Switzerland, I saw many different species, including deer, tree squirrels, marmots, foxes, owls, ibex, chamois, and other wildlife. Yet, my most memorable interaction was when I was once having my lunch in a mountain ridge, uh, just behind the ridge, to cover myself in the wind that day. And at one point, a huge adult eagle was gliding a couple of meters just right above the ridge on my head over me. And the majestic bird just sealed over my head. And I heard the air, which eagle's feathers was pushing away and was a magnificent memory and I can still recall all the details until this day and I often think back about it as a incredible human wildlife interaction. Okay, um, <clears throat> did you have access to modern commodities while you were in these alpine huts? Well, as I shortly mentioned earlier, during the first two summers, I had access to modern commodities, including an in-house toilet, running water, solar power, electricity, cell service, road access, daily possible food supply, etc., etc. But during the last summer, I had no in-house toilet, nor running water or cell service. My living space was reduced to approximately four square meters or 45 square feet, and no electricity, but I had a wooden stove and gas to cook, so I would say I had the bare minimum, and it was incredible, honestly. Yeah, I, I'm curious to what extent you actually feel exposed or connected to nature. I really like this question, Falk. Um, so during the first two years, I have to be honest, I, was, I fair, rarely felt the really exposed to nature, except maybe for some extreme weather conditions. But during the third summer, I felt highly exposed and a lot more connected to nature. Um, because I think this remoteness and the exposure to nature strongly facilitates the feeling of being connected to and with nature. And how is the Swiss Alps agriculture activity influencing the wilderness there? Well, the agricultural activities are quite heavily influencing the environment of Swiss Alps, I think, because forests have been cut down in the past to make space for pastures. Cattle is on those pastures and in the forests 
disturbing wildlife in open and forest covered places. So there's quite some disturbance happening, uh, but also removing forest reduced the habitats for forest inhabiting species and likely also reduces the stability and protection of the forest that the forest usually provides. Crucial, uh, for example, for steep slope uh, like they often occur in Switzerland. Uh, on the other hand, though, the open areas that resulted from forest cl clear cuts provided living spaces for open area high altitude species like marmots, as a part of a squirrel family, actually. However, looking at the livestock wildlife interaction perspective, such agricultural activities can negatively affect the local wildlife by spreading livestock diseases in natural areas and can thereby infect the wild animals. However, vice versa, we can also observe livestock animals getting extremely sick by the exposure to natural diseases, which then require an intense antibiotic treatment. For instance, for the disease assembling so-called infectious keratoconjunctivities, which causes animals to become blind within a few weeks if they're not treated, or other diseases as well. To what extent are those activities sustainable? What do you think? I would consider these activities, let's say, partially sustainable. Because farmers living in the valleys often put their cattle on these mountain pastures in order to save the more uh, productive pastures in lower altitudes uh, to be mowed and to store it as hay or silage for the winter months to reduce the need to acquire and import additional feed uh, for the farmer's animals. So utilizing lower quality pastures in higher altitude and steep slope seems to make the best use of, out of the available feed resources on a local scale. Additionally, by feeding on such high altitude pastures every year, such areas remain forest free with no major regeneration possibilities for local forests. And this has arguably pros and cons. However, when considering the overall farming activities, issues such as overconsumption remain and make it hardly fully uh, sustainable. Now applied on alpine meadow systems, commercialization and overstocking are still to be considered for such pristine environments that would otherwise ca carry wild plants and remain untouched. A similar issue has been described by Pralat and colleagues in an article about red pandas, tourism and agriculture, in the mountain regions of Nepal, and this article uh, is linked also in the description of this podcast and can be accessed if desired. Similarly to the issue with tourism, agriculture, and cattle in this case for the Swiss Alps. I'm just curious whether the Swiss farming approach is comparable with uh, the neighboring nations in the Alps. I believe that these farming approaches are definitely comparable with other farming approaches in neighboring nations of the Alps, but in a sense they're also quite unique because such approaches are also uh, used and taken in, for instance, the home region where I come from in South Tyrol, the most northern part of Italy. Yet it is quite different there since the remoteness is less. And in other neighboring countries such as France, uh, Germany and Austria, it is less executed in such, a, such an extent as in Switzerland. Uh, would such schemes be reproducible in different parts of the world? And if yes, what what would the benefit be? From I think that? that such schemes would definitely be reproducible in other parts of the world. Both management of cattle and other livestock animals in high altitudes and remote areas, as well as the lifestyle associated to the keeping of livestock in such environments. The premise for such schemes is that by implementing them, the limited spaces can be utilized more efficiently and sustainably. Would you recommend other teens and adults to repeat or to live similar experiences? And why would that be? Definitely. Uh, as I mentioned before, it taught me so many things at a young age, which still help me to this day. And many teens and young adults would most definitely enjoy and long-term benefit from such experiences, in my opinion. Considering that people want to be off the grid and be in nature uh, and in harmony with the world, how does the reality really fare? I think it's certainly possible to live such a life long-term, yet it's not easy and not the most comfortable life, one would say. 
especially in northern hemisphere winters and then in high altitudes can become very unpleasant very fast. Also, one would have to live off some kind of income or reserves. Just living in the mountains far away from everyone hardly pays modern day bills. And most costs can, of course, be drastically reduced. But being totally self sufficient is very hard, in my opinion, and in modern days. Reliving very similar experiences is definitely possible. And there's a website where many Swiss farmers look every year for a new seasonal workforce. I believe the website is www.zalp.ch, and I'm sure if I can also link it in the description of this podcast. And for anyone interested in reliving similar experiences outside of Switzerland and not necessarily with cattle, there are plenty of websites where farmers and non-farmers are looking for temporary helpers. Picking the location and the extent of remoteness is then the task of the one interested. An example of such a website is www.workaway.info. Uh, Falk can also link this uh, in the description of the podcast. There is a steady state economy, as you know, ecological economics and also indigenous efforts. How does that link with your Alpine Meadow experience? Are there any common commonalities and is it similar? As you know, Falk, and maybe some of our listeners as well, Steady state economics promotes a steady GDP, a steady physical wealth on a stable population. And it is possible to follow steady state econo economy approaches, since all these activities and experiences are lived on a limited land with limited resources. By utilizing these lower quality pastures in high altitudes and steep slopes, resources are arguably better utilized than keeping livestock on prime pastures in the valley and additionally purchasing feed throughout the year to sustain the feed demand. One must keep the financial sustainability in mind though, so every farmer that puts its livestock on such mountain pastures pays a seasonal fee in order for the animals to be cared for and to be milked if possible. So some might capitalize of such schemes and therefore slightly violate steady state approaches. Yet overall, I think it's definitely possible, yes. Talking about indigenization efforts, uh, specifically in Switzerland, this is not a major point of concern since the land is mostly owned by local Swiss people. Yet if such schemes would be implemented in other countries and regions of the world, one would have to assure that such newly implemented systems don't create land ownership and stewardship issues with local and indigenous people. If that is guaranteed, I think it's definitely a viable scheme. Seen from a wider perspective, would such a lifestyle be reproducible on a larger scale as an alternative living style in the future? What do you think? Yes, I definitely think that such lifestyles would be reproduced on a larger scale as an alternative living style, though one must keep in mind that such lifestyles can become tough, especially in cold climates and where winters can be harsh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and being fully self-sufficient is even harder in modern days and this makes such a lifestyle often a seasonal experience and hardly to be executed for a whole year or multiple years in a row. Also one must keep in mind the financial sustainability, otherwise such systems are hardly viable as an actual lifestyle in my opinion. Considering that um, there's actual, actual jobs such as farming and people do seasonal work throughout the world for a living. What are your overall pros and cons on such a lifestyle? And how about the fit with a modern industrial society, including uh, um, social welfare and pension plans and those type of perspectives? In my opinion, the overall pros include a life in which you're closely interacting with nature, livestock and wildlife. You are working outdoors for the most time rather than in offices behind screens. Uh, it is physically demanding, so one maintains good fitness. And last, it is rather sim a simplistic life, and some might appreciate that. Uh, looking at the cons now, it can be hard, both physically and mentally, and maybe not something for everyone. Uh, one must also be outdoors no matter the weather or the temperatures. So one must have quite a tough skin, I would say. And as most agricultural lifestyles, the salary is weather and seasonal dependent. So there are hardly any fixed and guaranteed financial compensations in such sectors. 
So in conclusion, what are your final three take-home messages for our listeners? My final three take-home messages are, first, if you are a teen or young adult, go and experience such an experience. It enriched me in multiple facets and would, I would recommend it to every young adult. It truly helps to discover and connect with yourself and something extremely important for us to be done in early years in my opinion. And secondly, such experiences are tough and physically and mentally, but they are extremely rewarding and something extraordinary. And lastly, try to go outside as much as possible. Try to appreciate the surrounding nature. I strongly believe that it helps us humans to feel and be more balanced. It balances our mental health and helps us to better deal with modern life and all that comes with it. One hour a day outside in nature can significantly help you to find yourself, to figure out who you are and come to peace with yourself and help to be balanced both mentally and physically. And there are studies that have shown that the color green calms us down and being outside in nature with fresh air in locations around the world where possible, of course, stimulates our brain and helps us be more creative, productive and focused. So it most definitely is something I would recommend to everyone. Okay, thank you so much. That concludes our podcast uh, with a guest um, and the interview with Moritz Steiner. I um, hope you find it inspiring. And if you have any questions, please follow up with us. There are some more details provided in the write-up. And um, also a photo is shown there. But uh, thanks again to Moritz. And um, yeah, looking forward to hearing from you again. And please stay in touch. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Falk. I hope the listeners found it interesting and informative. Thank you very much for your time. And I would always love to come back on your podcast. Thank you again for your invitation. Bye-bye.